Hey, everybody. Thanks for showing up on a Sunday afternoon. As you might know, the Air Force and Northrop Grumman rolled out rolled out the B-21 Raider on Friday in Palmdale at their facility in Palmdale. This is kind of what it looked like. So you see the guys behind like a, a crew of dozens rolling away the curtain, kind of like it reminds me of a baseball field crew rolling a tarp up, but they slowly rolled the airplane forward and they had some cool music going on and the dramatic lighting. And they called this a reveal, but really they, they didn't show the entire airplane. So joining us for commentary and expertise is the channel's favorite former Strike Eagle weapons system officer, Mike Paco Benitez. Mike is the founder and the guy who puts out the Merge newsletter each and every week. It is a weekly, isn't it, Mike? It is, every Sunday. Yeah, so if you guys are not subscribed to the Merge yet, I'll be putting the subscription link in the chat. It's free, um, and it is chock full of goodness. So more to follow on that. But let's talk, Mike, about this B-21 Raider. So why the sort of show some leg but not the entire thing? Why the semi-reveal? Why so much secrecy around this airplane? Uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me on today. The, the secrecy around uh, all defense programs is pretty obvious, but the bomber one in particular, and, and there's, there's a history that goes back to uh, the, the way the B-2 bomber was revealed back uh, in November of 1988, and they actually screwed that up. Uh, <laughs> and we can, we, can, we can show some pictures of how they, they went about it. It's at the same plant. There you go. It's, it occurred at the same plant, a different hangar. And so what they did, if you look at this picture, the, the stands, or the blue stands, were the kind of uncleared people. So they had a very limited view, which looks very similar to the view that you saw with the B-21 rollout. And all the employees who, who have been working on the program are on the sides. And so they can see the side in the back. Um, but you notice they had pulled the, the bomber all the way out of the hangar, and they did not close the airspace above Palmdale. So an Aviation Week reporter rented a Cessna, flew directly over the, the reveal and took a bunch of pictures uh, top down of the B2 and then published it in a magazine article. And so one of the uh, the aspects of the B2 program, the angular relationships, there was trying to be uh, hold that secret as long as possible. And that made uh, it made a national magazine uh, based on some errors. And so what you saw with the B21 rollout, it did a few things differently. Number one, they did it at night. Number the two, they took all of the phones away from anyone who attended and they had to be at a very limited angle with a very with only a certain cleared cameras so no uh, like slr uh, zoom lens kind of lenses there's only a few photos that were cleared to be releasable um and the other thing they did is to close down the airspace so the combination of all of that you, there was no way that you're not you, they wanted to control the narrative again because those angular relationships you could start putting together some some things pretty quickly and I think uh, those will be known when it starts doing its taxi test. You know, right now, when you saw the reveal, uh, it has three things. It has wings, it's got windows, and it's got wheels. <laughs> so they towed it out uh, a little bit of the hangar. If you notice, it didn't come all the way out. And then they uh, did the reveal, and then they pushed it back in and closed the hangar doors before they let anyone actually leave. And again, that's basically preserve that angle, uh, the restricted angle viewing. So obviously, this airplane looks like the B-2. In fact, one of the running jokes going on is this is the not the B-21, but the B-2.1. So talk to us about how we got here with the flying wing, the Air Force's history, and the lineage of the B-21. Yeah, so, so Roman was, uh, was founded by a guy named Jack uh, Northrup, and he had an idea back in the 1930s about a flying wing. And uh, this is before World War II. The Nazis had done some stuff during the war, but he had this original idea and he built the uh, the N1, which you see on the screen as a proof of concept. Uh, so that got a lot of attention. It was pretty unstable, but it, it proved the concept in 1940. And so they took that and they developed uh, what was called the N9M, uh, which is M for model. And it was a third scale prototype 
uh, there it is in 1942. And it's a, it's a, it had a 60 foot wingspan. If you notice, it's a little bit bigger. The engines are a little bit further apart. Uh, but this wasn't, this was a subscale demonstrator. And, and the numbers are important here. I guess it's 1942. Uh, it had just under a 60 foot wingspan. Again, one third scale. So that flew, it proved out the concept of a uh, aerodynamically stable flying wing. Uh, so then they took that and they built a full size. And so the full size one, and that's the, uh, what became right there, the, the YB-49. But before that was what was called the YB-35, which was a uh, propeller driven one. There you go. Uh, they only built two of them and they basically pivoted from the propeller driven to a jet engine powered. Uh, what's interesting about that is the the YB35 and the YB49 have the exact same wingspan as the B2. So this is in the 1940s. They had figured out a aerodynamically stable, efficient flying wing design. What had happened though is there were some politics in the in the early 50s that led to the cancellations of all these programs. The prototypes were scrapped, melted down. And the Air Force started to prioritize high and fast. So jet powered, long range bombers, whether it was the B-47, the B-58, uh, the Hustler, uh, the B-36 was a piece, the Peacemaker at the time, which is a six engine propped uh, nuclear bomber. Uh, so those were kind of the way that the Air Force was moving. And really, they didn't see a, a, a place for this flying wing design. And oh, by the way, in the, in, the, in the late 40s and early 50s, one of the byproducts that they had figured out through this they stumbled upon is like hey the the radar cross section of this is actually pretty small compared to a normal airplane and so when you take the propellers away and you add the jet engines and you had this fl this flat flying wing it's uh, it's got a pretty low signature uh no one really cared about that at the time though and so what happened is you you fast forward into the late 70s and and suddenly um Radar frequency, um, low observability, stealth started becoming a thing because everyone had radars. And so that's just during the Cold War and a program called Tactic Blue um, Northrop participated in. And they built uh, this. It was called the Whale. It, didn't, it doesn't actually have a designation. And the purpose of this program was to use a continuous curvature um, RCS management. So you, there's a lot of shapes in that. Oh, by the way, if you look at the cockpit, it looks very similar to the front of the B-2 bomber. That's uh, that's not a coincidence. And so they used some advances in fluid dynamics at the time to, to build a new way to model uh, signature. So now if you take what they learned with flying wings and you take what they learned about fluid dynamics in the tactic blue, you put those two things together and now you get what became the ATB, uh, which is the uh, advanced tactical bomber, I believe it was called. And that was the program that led to the B-2. So the B-2 that we see today actually isn't the B-2 that was built. Uh, the original flying wing design, there you go. Um, from my late 70s until about 84, it looked uh, like it does on the left. And what had happened was the Air Force, based on the changing nature of uh, a war with Russia, said, hey, low altitude, high speed, is what we really want too. And so the, the flying wing is optimized as a high altitude, high subsonic design. It's very, very efficient. So Northrop had to go back to the drawing board and modify the B-2 design after they'd already locked it down. And it cost the Air Force $2 billion to modify the B-2 design. So it took about two years from about 84 to 86. And the, the right side of that, of that picture is what they is what you see. So they moved the cockpit. They had to move the, the inlets. And then they had to change the tail. This is the most important design change. They had to change the tail because they had to add more control surfaces and there was no more room. And so they solved that from going from a, a simple W tail into the, the jagged tail pattern that you see with the B2. And that's what allows it to do low altitude flight because it has enough um, rudder authority. So what do we know about the B-21? How big is it compared to the, the B-2? What kind of engines does it have? What other specs are uh, do we know at this time? Yeah, so they're, uh, for obvious reasons, we're being very sensitive with it. What we can tell you, uh, and what you can see from the pictures, we do know um, that Pratt & Whitney is on contract to, to provide the, the power plants. We do know, based on the way that the program is structured, we can talk about why it's actually on time and on budget, which is an anomaly. Um, we do know that it's using an engine that already exists, so they're not building new engines. Uh, and based on that, you can, you can do some deduction. And it, 
it likely is going to be an F-135 engine, uh, and it's going to use two of them. So if you look at the intakes, you can tell that is a that there is an intake, and it's a um, it's a staggered intake design, and there's one engine on each side of the of the cockpit. And so that you start putting that together. Okay, well, if it's an F-135 power plant, it doesn't use afterburners because flying wings don't go supersonic. If you say, what's the mill power for uh, an F-135 engine? That's the engine that's used in the F-35. We put two of them in this. You can start deriving how much power and thrust to weight ratio and what the size of this bomber is going to be. And then you look at the weight. So that's propulsion. The B-21 is unique uh, in that it only has a single truck main landing gear. So the B-2 has a, uh, a tandem truck. So it has four, land four wheels on each main landing gear. The B-21 only has two. So when you do some math and you look at some, some examples out there in aviation, uh, the C-130 and the 737 are the two that kind of jump out as, hey, there's only two uh, wheels on each uh, main landing gear. So one of them is a you know tandem truck and one of them is a traditional truck. And so you can start doing some math and you go, well, in aviation, that's about 150 to maybe 200,000 pounds with some advances in engineering. You could probably get that up to 250 to 280, but you're not going to get it more, much more than 280,000 pounds just based on uh, the sitting weight of those tires. When you look at the, the size of the B2 and the weight, all that math starts to triangulate on a size specification that's basically 75% of the, the size of a B2. So to uh, to geek out a little bit on the procurement side, uh, the Merge newsletter that was pushed this morning uh, says in terms of contracts, the B-21 was developed with a dual contract structure. So does that provide cost savings to the taxpayer? Will that accelerate and, and sort of underwrite the idea that it will be on time and at least on budget, if not under budget? What's, what's going on with a dual contract structure? So the, the way that this program was funded is that the, the research and development, so the actual development of the bomber was done on a cost plus contract, which means that the, you know, it's going to cost this much, uh, tell us what it costs. We'll give that whatever that negotiated profit margin is and some incentives if for schedule, we'll give that to you. So Northrop is documenting how much it's costing to build plus call it 10 or 11%. And then that's what the Air Force is paying as a, as a services, basically. All of the risk for uh, time and schedule and costs, all the risk is on the, the Air Force, not the company. The company is just figuring it out. Well, once they've figured it out and they lock in the design, now you want to buy them under the other contract structure, which is a firm fixed price, price contract. Uh, and it it's baselined in, in 2010 dollars of 550 million dollars a copy, which uh, if you go to if you use inflation, that works out to about 700 or so, uh, 700 million dollars a copy in, in 2022 dollars. Uh, and and that contract structure is important because there's a there's some history behind it of of why the B21 looks the way it looks, why it's the size that it is, and how it's able to hit these milestones for uh, cost schedule performance. Uh, and that kind of goes back to most military programs, as, as your, your listeners are probably aware of. We either have requirements creep, we have overambitious designs that take that are way harder than we think to get through uh, research and development, and just makes turning you know science fiction into science. It turns out it's really hard. Uh, so the the track record is pretty terrible for the for the U.S. military of doing that. So what makes this program interesting? is that there was a bomber that uh, there's a bomber program between the B2 and the B21. So there was a program uh, in the, let's see what it was, the early 2000s, so about 20 years ago, the Air Force had a program called the Next Gen Bomber, NGB. And it was trying to do all these crazy things. And what had happened was uh, the, the fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan kind of took over the front pages. Uh, the same year that the F-22 program was curtailed by the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Defense killed the next-gen bomber. So that program died before it. it had a few billion dollars of uh, some studies and some stuff, but they never actually bent any metal. So the Air Force kind of went back and said, we need a bomber. What can we do that's, that's the most mature way to do this? And so they came up with this uh, long-range strike family of systems. So the original, the bomber part of that was LRS-B, that's the bomber. 
uh, and it has some munitions and some other stuff. And so what they did was they said, we're going to control the cost by not developing anything new that we don't need to. So I don't need new avionics. I can use stuff out of the F-35 program. I don't need new engines. I could use them over here. Uh, ejection seats, uh, er everything you can think of. Like all I need is a new airframe and I want to reuse as much stuff as I can. And so I'm focusing the, the engineering challenge is on the airframe and the integration. So we don't want to get overly complex. We don't want to get too ambitious with the requirements. We just want to build a better flying wing using modern engineering practices and the advancements that have occurred in uh, low observability, avionics, computing, that kind of thing. And so that is what kind of constrain the requirements and that's what controls the cost. And that's how it's able to hit these milestones. So just for your reader, uh, your listeners awareness. So in 2010, this program started, the contract to build this bomber was awarded in 2015 and the first flight's going to occur next year. So when you look at a military aircraft program, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pre that's pretty fast by V twenty two JSF standards. Um, and as you mentioned in the newsletter, this development, the DTOT process they're using here, is kind of modeled after the F one seventeen. So talk to us about what specifically F one seventeen did in terms of. Uh, leveraging other aircraft technologies and, and using best practices to try to, uh, you know, make it to the finish line in a timely fashion. Not to mention that was a completely black program. Is this a black program? Uh, that's kind of a weighted term. Uh, yes, this is a this is a uh, a classified program. There's different types of classified programs. Um, this would be you see it, so you can you see it. So it is a, an acknowledged special access program. Well, but so that, um, that's what I mean. I mean, yeah. I know it's a weighted yeah. term, but a yeah. black program, as Correct. I mentioned in my one of my earliest episodes, the secret program in front of a yep. secret program, right? They had the that's MIG. Right. We were fighting MIGs, constant peg, uh, mm -hmm. and that was actually a cover program, so you wouldn't ask any questions about what was going on at Tonopah behind the MIG program, right? As well as being a cool dogfighting program for fighter guys it was also a cover program for the f-117 so this isn't shrouded in that level of secrecy right correct yeah that's correct it's it's managed by what's called the the rco the rapid capabilities office from the air force and they deal with a lot of uh a lot of sensitive programs they're managing this one uh but, but to your point about the f-117 model you know that was the last aircraft the air force uh developed built and um fielded on time <laughs> so i mean that it kind of tells you something about the it's when we say it's an anomaly, it's an anomaly. And the F-117, the reason it was able to do that is they focused all of the engineering challenges on its signature. So there is a there's an IR signature, there's an acoustic signature and there's a radar signature. And the, and the engineering program was uniquely focused on that. And so what they didn't have to do is they didn't have to develop a new engine. They, they used engines that have an F-18 just with no afterburner. They use the HUD out of the F-18. The environmental control system for the F-117 came out of the C-130. Um, the flight control systems use the F-111 actuators. Um, the, they also used an F-16 computer to, to fly it because it was aerodynamically unstable. And then they used uh, brakes out of an F-15 and the uh, the INS, the, inert, the navigation system, out of a B-52. So they basically raided the parts bins throughout the Air Force to, to put this thing together uh, to, to, to do something very disruptive on a timeline that mattered. Yeah. Wow. I did not know that. So speaking of B-52, viewer Jim K says, I hope the buff stays around forever because it's one of the best reminders of the greatness of our country. Sorry, I'm a retired high school teacher, history teacher, and a veteran. So the point behind what Jim's talking about, or the question behind what Jim's talking about, is what is the B-21 replacing in the inventory? Great questions. The B-52 is going to be around for a long, long time. Uh, the B-21, the intent... If you, the way the Air Force structures right now for the bombers, we have three bombers. There is the B-1B, the B-2, and the B-52. The Air Force strategy is to consolidate from a three-bomber force down to a two-bomber force. So you have a stand-in bomber and a standoff bomber. The stand-in bomber is going to be the B-21. The standoff bomber is going to be the B-52. And for that reason, the B-1B is starting to get retired now. Like this last year, 19 more went to the, went to the boneyard. The B-2 is going to be on its way out. Um, once the B-21 gets its nuclear certification, 
uh, for that uniquely B2 mission. And then the B-52 is getting a number of upgrades, new engines, new avionics. Um, it's getting a, a pretty sweet radar upgrade uh, to modify it so it can, and, and getting new weapons for standoff uh, so we can actually persist and do its mission for the next you know 20 or 30 years. So how long will that have been in service? And remind me what that B-52's total lifespan is projected. Is it like 80 years? Oh, it's I mean, going to be over 80. Over 80. <laughs> Yeah, it, wow. it might actually hit 100, which is insane. That's but insane. it was a it was a you know an aircraft that was designed with was you know pencil and slide rules, you know, right? And they it's it was over engineered. Yeah, it turns out that's if you want something to last, you build it to last, and you know, that wasn't the the idea at the time. It's just how it turned out. Yeah. So another one of the uh, assets that y you provided is this weapons uh, breakdown here. So. What are we talking about here with the GBO 57 versus GBO 72, a weapon you're very familiar with as a Strike Eagle guy? Yeah. So the the B2, um, it was originally certified for a 40,000 pound payload. So it can carry 40,000 pounds of munitions. The GBU 57 is a 30,000 pound penetrator and the, B, the B2 can carry two of them now. So sometimes this is why sometimes when you look at some stuff online it, you might say the b2 can carry forty thousand pounds and then some places it'll say it can carry sixty thousand pounds um the re the only way it carries 60 is with two gb 57s and that being said i have no idea um what the size of the weapons bay of the b21 is the way that they they did the angles that they didn't show any lines and so you can't do any math uh to try to figure that out it does look like, uh, if I could speculate a little bit, that the B-21 is a very narrow aircraft where that side view of the B-2 there is pretty pretty long relative. Um, so there's a picture uh, of the B-2, B-21 outside. It was released from Northrop, and there's a shadow, and you can kind of see the wing line, uh, what the actual like design looks like. Uh, and the wings and the, the wing roots by the gear and everything are very, very thin. So... Uh, I'm not sure if the B, if the, the GB57 will even fit in the B21, uh, but I do know is that the smaller uh, weapons that are being developed, uh, they're smaller relative to your 5,000 pound bunker buster. Like they will absolutely fit in the B21. So the concept here is, as you said, not standoff, but but definitely high altitude delivery, um, as opposed to what the B1 was designed to do, which is come in low. Um, so is that what we're thinking the way the b21 will be employed it's not going to come in low is it based on based on what we know about the the renderings of the the airfoil design for the flying wing that is a that is a high altitude very efficient long range design uh so high subsonic so not optimized to fly low altitude uh and not uh optimized to fly supersonic nope so how many are we supposed to buy great question well it depends uh the there's, there's some political backstory of why 80 to 100 is the official talking points when you do the math over the long term and you you account for training attrition depot um just training accidents that number starts to look like 145 to 150 if you uh, throw some in there for mom and the kids for just uh mission expansion that that could be up to 180 uh, and that doesn't include um fms or exports or partners so Australia is actually jumped in the lead um, and very, very interested in, in buying uh, the B-21. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of high level talks going on between uh, senior officials between the two countries. And that would be huge because, you know, most people may not realize it, but everyone loves fighters. I love fighters. I'm a fighter guy. But at the end of the day, the United States is the only partner ally with a bomber. That's it. We, we're the only people who have a bomber force and able to hold targets at risk at long ranges. We depend on other, our NATO partners. None of them have bombers. Uh, no one in the Pacific has bombers. There's only three countries in the world that have bombers. The other two are Russia and China. And so if we can get other people to participate in this program, um, especially in the Pacific, uh, Australia is obviously the, uh, the preferred partner due to AUKUS. Uh, but you have, you know, the, 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 you know, the British and, and, and NATO and a few other things like that. So uh, this, the, the strategic importance of this program cannot be uh, understated. It is going to be a big, big deal. And this is why there's so much support politically behind it. There's a lot of scar tissue between the B1 program getting um, curtailed uh, and the F-22 program getting curtailed. Um, that's why when you see the F-35 requirements, you know, you ask the Air Force, they go, how many F-35s are you going to buy? And they go, well, I'm going to buy 1,763. Like, 
that's a very specific number. Like, yep, that's exactly how many I need. And then you ask him, well, how many bombers are you going to buy? Like, well, I don't know, maybe 80, maybe 200. I don't know. So there, there's a, there's definitely some talking point variances between the fighters and bombers. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of political backstory. Most people don't realize that the B2, when we funded that program, we were originally going to buy about 158 B2s. Then that program got, got uh, the actual requirement got locked in at 132 and then it dwindled down to 20. Well, so if you see the lower third here, the, the freckle poony, I guess that's how you say it, uh, comments. I had the original number of 132, the number you just cited yeah. and built, or even the reduced number of 75. I very much doubt the B21 would exist. More like the B B two continually upgraded. So, what do you think about that comment? Is, is that true? I completely, yeah, I completely agree. There would probably be a program to replace the B fifty two. Okay. okay. If we if we had one hundred and thirty two B twos on the ramps today, yeah, uh, we, the B one wouldn't exist, and we would be looking at a program to replace the B fifty two. Well, I think what happens here, just like the B B one, because procurement takes so long. You know, developmental test, operational test takes so long, fielding an airplane, getting it to the fleet. Mm -hmm. The world changes during that time. B1, uh, I would I would say, and this is sort of a dumbed down version of this, so keep me honest, the threat changed that made the B1 uh, not as survivable as originally we thought it was going to be, right? The, the way to defeat strategic SAMs in the late 70s was to come in low and then the sam threat got more sophisticated and absolutely the way to get shot down was to come in low so now the b1 the world passes them by further it didn't it had no smart weapons no precision weapons capability until deep into the post 9 11 wars it was sort of modified kind of like the way the tomcat was modified ironically just a more glorified way and, and they could carry more bombs so that's that's part a I think the same could be said about the B-2, because let's remember the budget is re-legislated, re-litigated every year. Yes, That's we right. have a five-year defense plan, but, um, you know, in fact, I have an upcoming episode talking about the Ford-class carrier with the guy, Captain Tal Manville, who was the original Ford-class carrier class desk officer. <laughs> and this was in, wait for it, because the Ford just got back from its first deployment, right? The two-monther where they went to Portsmouth, England. Oh, yeah. Halifax and, you know, sort of a show the flag cruise, not not really an operational cruise, um, but it did deploy. It did some bilats. The elevators are working. The cats are working. Um, he was the class desk in 1996, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. When Admiral Borda, the late great Admiral Borda said, Tal, be bold, right? And, and so he baked into the discussion of how the Ford got developed is the budget piece. You cannot ignore that, right? We're supposed to have 12. Right now, we only have four that are budgeted. And so same, same for the B1 and the B2. And so each year, people are like, you know, because there's the, not to be cynical, the pork element, you know, the lawmakers are like vying for the glorified jobs program that is the defense budget. And so if you do not have this inarguable threat that you're building an, a platform against, then it's a jump ball and you might lose. Right. So that's the other reality, because in the in hindsight, we're like, oh, geez, we should have. I mean, I'm a Tomcat guy. We should have kept the Tomcat. Right. We should have fielded the super Tomcat and we wouldn't have mm -hmm. needed the Super Hornet and we wouldn't need you wouldn't even need NGAD. Right. Uh, I mean, we'd already have it in the form of a, of a super Tomcat that had evolved with the technology that was available. But that's not how the world goes. Right. So, yeah, when you when it turns out when you uh, when you, you rely on the adversary to drive your requirements uh you know you don't control <laughs> they get a vote and when they when they change things it, it disrupts your your programs and your you know we, I, I when the pentagon used to work in the pentagon and, and there was a friend of mine who used to work down in, in the basement and his uh, his goal was to you know rebuild the air force from 20 years from now every morning uh, on a powerpoint so and excel sheets so hey this one thing's changed how does this like you know propagate throughout all of our force design for the next 20, 25 years. Talk to whether a budgeteer. Yeah. They do these <laughs> yeah. Things called drills, right? Yep. And, and every day it's a science project. What if we yeah. had 123? Okay, now make it 119. You know, I, I just, they'll just hand in this math that took them three days of heads down total work and they'll go, 
Yeah, try now with five less. You know, yeah. it's just, it's the most thankless, Sisyphus-like work ever. You know, yeah, and, I, know and, how and, people and I totally become, agree. And you know, the assumptions, years. yeah, the assumptions are uh, matter. And, you know, the F-35 is probably the greatest example because this, you know, it's 1,763. You're like, well, how did you arrive at that number? Like, well, if you take every F-16, every A-10, and you add them all together, like, that's the number. <laughs> like, well, we're not, we're not, we're not getting rid of the F-16 for quite a while now. We're going to keep about 600 around for the next 20 years. So is the number going to change? Like, nope. Like, well, the assumptions have changed, like, but they don't want to change the number. So it's a, uh, it's a, and that's where I, you see the B-21. It's like, Hey, depending on um, stand in standoff and, and missions, uh, especially it's interesting, especially when you look at like multi-domain, cross-domain, uh, long range, high speed, you know, the army is, is, has some surface to surface hypersonic programs that you could argue that some of the air force um, proponents would say is, is treads on their territory based on rules and missions. And so like, well, if the army does that, maybe we don't need as many bombers, but the cost per unit for that is higher than a bomber. And so there, there's, you know, the inner service politics definitely has a role to play, but yeah, the, the world changes, uh, you know, all the time is continually evolving. And, you know, and one of the things I enjoy about doing the newsletter from the merge is, you know, I get to, live in that and and report out hey here are the things that are going on the tech trends and happenings and, and the deals that are happening to to basically build that future it's a very forward-looking kind of lens that i try to, to bring to to the readers well plus you have the ability to translate it and that's rare um you know because if you talk to somebody from that arena and i lived this firsthand when i was working on the v22 program my first job out of the navy um you, you think I use a lot of acronyms, Talk to a, <laughs> a procurement type, you know, and yeah. e either a civil servant or, uh, you know, a, an EDO, an engineering duty, duty officer, an aviation engineering duty officer. Um, it, it's life by acronyms and, you know, things like the fit up and, you know, XCOM and OPAVAL. And it's mm -hmm. just a, a million acronyms. So they're, they're wedded to, the paradigm, right? The, the, the model of it. And, and so breaking out of that is, is, is really, is really tough. And uh, again, as a fleet guy, I would just complain when they'd issue a red stripe down in the airplanes or whatever. I'm like, what is nav air for? They're just, you know, keeping us from flying. And then you go there, you're like, Oh, I get it. This is hard. Developing a system is hard. Like you think of something like um, the P eight, right? It's just a 737 with asw equipment in it right yep. like how hard can that be and then you put all that asw equipment in the airplane and there's coherency issues and you know all kinds of things are happening in terms of the emi and and you, you realize oh geez this is not easy that's why you have these systems commands and test pilots and procurement experts and engineering duty officers and so forth so Oh, don't get me started on that. That's like the KC-46 oh, is our... Is our well, you know. that's a conversation <laughs> for another day, right? This is the only time you're going to be on the channel. Yeah. Um, so back to the, the B-21, another question people are going to ask is how much does it cost? And I know you can answer that a bunch of different ways, but what, what are some of the numbers that are being uh, thrown around about? The... the, con the Production contract is capped at $550 million a jet in 2010 dollars. Um, right now, uh, they're on contract for, at $692 million a piece. So if you do the math just from inflation, $2010, $550 million in 2010 is about $725 to $750 million today. So they're actually underpriced. Um, and that's how we're buying them right now. And that price, that price, that firm fixed price is how we're able to speed the market. And, you know, the company is incentivized. The, the, the more under price that they can get it, the better. Um, so that being said, you know, Northrop, you know, they, they're, you know, their logos on the side of the plane, but, you know, they're, they're the assembler and the integrator. Um, most people don't realize aircraft are very complex and the B-21 has four hundred supplier companies that are all building the different pieces uh to then integrate uh at the at the northrop facility to actually build a bomber the f-35 is about the same they have a, they have close to 500 uh but this is a you know massively complex program and the fact that they're able to do this fast and oh by the way through you know supply chain issues of covid etc uh 
it just speaks to the the level of commitment and the and the program management and oversight. And I think the Air Force has been really good about communicating with Congress uh, openly, early and often to make sure that they are they understand the issues, how the issues are being worked through. Um, great, great example. One of the few public uh, things that have ever come out about the B-21 with uh, production issues was the engines and the airframe. So you take an engine that was designed to be in a fighter um, and you want to put it behind these uh, serpentine intakes. So it kind of snakes, the air has to snake its way to the intake. Uh, you, you run into some design challenges from the engine performance uh, because the, the airflow is, is coming in much differently than was designed. The engine was not designed to do that. And so they had to work through the design of those intakes. And those intakes are probably the most interesting thing about the airplane of how the air actually gets into the engine. If you look at the B2, the engines, they're they're only kind of half installed. Uh, so some of it's in the, in the windstream to, to actually get the air down the four engines, the F-118s. But in the B-21, they're they're fully embedded into the airframe. And they use these serpentine intakes to feed the air into them. And that led to a ton of engineering challenges, whether then the solution is, well, it's either the airframe or the engine or both. And, you know, they work their way through it. Um, it'll be curious to see when it starts flight test in the different uh, flight regimes, whether it's uh, high altitude and slow is probably the, the, the worst place you want to be for something like that. Uh, but that's what we have test pilots for. Right. Amen. So is the testing going to be done at Edwards at the Palmdale facility? What, where are they going to be flying these airplanes before they're fielded? Yeah, it'll happen at Edwards. Uh, it will definitely happen at Edwards. So the first flights, uh, they'll have the, the checkout flights from the company test pilots will happen at uh, Edwards. And once, once they get certified uh, off the production line, they have, a, they no kidding, like the title to a car, it's, it's called a DD-250. You sign the form over and then like the Northrop Grumman signs that over to the Air Force and then the test pilot signs for the signs for it, gets the keys to the car, and then they'll fly it to Edwards where they have a, uh, what we call a CTF, a combined test force, is standing up to bed those down and they'll be doing flight tests um, out there. So you'll see a combined developmental test and operational test unit all in the same squadron. And so you have that kind of vertically integrated holistic look uh, as we build the test plans, execute uh, with with the engineering rigor on one side and then kind of the warfighter in mind on the other. So again, you've already said this, but what, what is the rough timeline for that through OT? What are we thinking? Uh, that's not been released. Um, oh. If I was a betting man, I would say 2027 is probably okay. when you'd see the first ones uh, hit a, you know, whether it's Dias or Whiteman or. Uh, yeah, that's the other question I was going to ask. So uh, at the rollout, Secretary Austin made some comments. Uh, this is sort of the global reach, global power theme. Like we can strike any target in the world. Didn't say exactly where that would be from. And then he mentioned logistics. So it was not clear what he meant by those references. Uh, so any, any clarity on when he's talking about logistics, this new fangled logistics thing that the B-21 has, uh, what, what is he talking about there? It's hard to say uh, if I were to speculate, you know, I think the way that this program is structured again, it's 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 minimizing what needs to be built that's new and it's leveraging what's out there. You know, like the B-21 landing gear, it looks very similar to an airliner. Uh, the engines. It, so the supply chains for all these parts are well established and they're well known. And you don't have to, if you have a hundred new parts on this aircraft, well, that's a hundred different supply chains that you have to manage and stand up. And so by, I think leveraging, if you, if you were to say 90% of this bomber is built from parts that already exist in the supply chain, you've just solved 90% of your supply chain problem. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so again, we don't know exactly where these are going to be based. Uh, the B-2 was at Whiteman, right? Is that where they were? Is that only where they were based? Where else was were B-2? Yeah, they're, they're pretty much all based out of Whiteman. Um, did they ever deploy? I mean, I know that they, they did like sorties where they'd launch out of Whiteman and bomb Afghanistan and land at Diego Garcia or something. But were they ever forward deployed or did they always stay at Whiteman? There's a few places the B-2s deploy to to base out of Guam and um, Fairford in England are the two. So you'll see okay. them go to the, in the Europe, they'll base out of the UK and the Pacific, they'll base out of Guam. But yes, they have gone to uh, Diego Garcia before. 
So we can imagine that's sort of the concept of deployment ops that the B-21 would, would do as well. Uh, I would imagine so. Yeah. yeah well, the Lord so. knows what the world's going to look like in 2027. <laughs> that's and right. Beyond, right. Um, yeah. Well, Paco, thanks very much for bringing your expertise. I've dropped, and I'll, let me do it one more time here. I'm dropping the, uh, the link in the chat of how to subscribe to the Merge newsletter. I'm telling you guys, this is pure gouge, as we say in the fleet. Um, push right to your inbox. It don't cost nothing. And uh, let's hook a brother up here um, and, uh, and subscribe. So, Paco, again, thanks. And we look forward to having you back on the channel uh, very soon. Thanks, Mooch. I appreciate it. I had a blast. Okay. See you guys. And thanks, everybody, for showing up on a Sunday. And I look forward to talking to you guys again very soon.